Okay, so we'll start with Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranangachami Dhammang Saranangachami Sangang Saranangachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranangachami Duty ampi dhammang saranangachami. Duty ampi sangang saranangachami. Tati ampi buddhang saranangachami. Tati ampi dhammang saranangachami. Tati ampi sangang saranangachami. So, good evening, good evening everybody, and welcome to this uh, Sutta uh, study class. And, uh, you know, in some of the past suttas on Kama, we've been uh, covering some sutras and, you know, talking about uh, the, the rebirth, how one is uh, reborn from, uh, you know, according to accumulated kama and so on and in, in different realms. And uh, I wanted to, I selected some sutras uh, this evening. If, uh, if you had seen those uh, attachments to these sutras that I had sent out uh, on Sunday and had a chance to read them over. Otherwise, I'm going to go over them uh, again now. Uh, but these are specifically uh, point to how uh, difficult it is to get the human uh, birth as compared to being born in other realms or having uh, lost the human, uh, having dying from the human realm to get another human birth or to be born in uh, other uh, realms, deva lokas or even the uh, realms of uh, animals or hells. And so just the fact of getting a human birth is uh, not easy <clears throat> because again, you know, there are only uh, let's say, seven billion uh, slots, you know, on the earth plane, uh, according to the population. Uh, but there are probably, you know, hundreds of billions of beings in other uh, realms and locus, and especially like the animal realm it said this itself, you know, there's, you know, hundreds of billions of in various types of... Uh, animals and then you have all the deva realms so uh you know just to get a human birth itself is a uh, is considered to be a rare opportunity because it also is because of being born as a human being is said to be because of having performed a good karma in the past and then just the fact that you've gotten a human birth doesn't uh, you know, it's not all that great for some people, right? And uh, especially in terms of having the right conditions to practice the Dhamma, you know, to, to be able to hear the Dhamma and practice the Dhamma. So these suttas uh, talk about uh, that. And uh, so you could say that this process is about, these suttas are describing uh, what we what we would call, or in Tibetan Buddhism, they call the perfect human rebirth. The fact that you've been born as a human and the, the fact that you've actually got an interest in the Dhamma, that you were somehow led to the Dhamma in this life, 
and then we're actually able to practice it and uh, to understand it and uh, realize it. All those are, uh, are the amount of people that you know make it to the end are considered to be very, very uh, few in number. So, and then at the end, uh, if we have enough time, we'll uh, talk about the, the eight accomplishments for uh, you know leading a person's life and for lay people how the other aspects of how uh, they should lead their life. Okay, so uh, these suttas are from the uh, Anguttara Nikaya, and uh, the book of these first ones are from the book of uh, ones, and. Uh, <clears throat> So I'm going to just be uh, reading uh, uh, a lot of this. So the Buddha is giving this, this talk and he says, Monks, in this Jambudipa, that's the name for India, there are delightful parks, groves, landscapes, lotus ponds, but these are few in number. Well, more numerous are the hills and slopes, rivers that are hard to cross, places with stumps and thorns and rugged mountains. So in the same way, those beings are few who when they pass away as human beings are reborn again among human beings. More numerous are those who when they die after having been a human being at the time of death, are reborn in other realms, even in hell, the animal realm, in the realm of afflicted spirits, or perhaps, of course, the deva realms, and if you practice meditation, then maybe the higher uh, the Brahma realms as well. And then he goes on to say, those beings are few who, when they pass away as human beings, are reborn among the devas. Uh, more numerous are those when they pass away as human beings, are reborn in hell, the animal realm, in the sphere of, a, of afflicted spirits. So it's saying here that when you die as a human, it's possible to be born as a deva, but it's more probable the ones who are born in higher realms after dying from the human realm, are few in number compared to those who are born in the lower realms. And of course, that's because of so much bad karma that uh, people uh, accumulate. And then it says, those beings are few when they pass away as devas. So if a person is in the deva realm, and when they die and pass away from a deva realm, they are reborn again among the devas. So those are few. More numerous are those who, when they pass away as devas, are reborn in the lower uh, realms. So too, those beings are few. When they pass away as devas, are reborn among human beings. So even when you pass away from a deva realm, uh, you know, your chances of getting human but uh, are much slimmer uh, than <laughs> your chances are better that you'll be born in a realm of uh, affliction or again as a deva. So this is all alluding to the fact that, you know, it's not easy to get a human birth once one has uh, lost it to get it again. Uh, and then he goes on to say, those beings are few if a person who is born in the hell realms uh, to, to be reborn again as a human being from the hell realm is a very, uh, you know, slight uh, possibility. More numerous are those when they pass away from hell are born in the animal realm or other realms of afflicted uh, spirits. And so too, when they pass away from the hells are born, reborn among the devas. So there are few. 
And it's saying again that those beings are few when they pass away from the animal realm are reborn among the human beings. So in all these different uh, classifications, again, the, the point is that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, get a human uh, birth. And so not to do things that would uh, uh, lose that, you know, when you die thinking automatically you will be born as a human being, uh, not necessarily. And then But this, uh, this next uh, selection of suttas is probably a little bit more, more interesting for, for probably uh, more of you, seeing how you, you already have a human uh, birth. So in, in the same way, he's talking about uh, uh, having a, a, a fortunate human birth and the right good conditions of human birth. So he's saying, again, he uses the, he talks about, in this India, there are delightful parks, groves, landscapes, and lotus ponds, but these are few in number. These nice, beautiful places, few in number than the more difficult places, like uh, thorny mountain slopes and hills and rivers hard to cross, places with stumps and thorns, rugged mountains, other difficulties, wild animals. So too are the beings are few that are, who are born on dry ground. More numerous are those beings who are born in water. So if you are, you know, born on the earth, you know, human beings are only you know, few that live on the earth compared with the amount of animals uh, that live on this uh, earth. So we're saying there's more beings that are born in the water than are born on the earth. That means, you know, the fishes and creatures in the ocean, uh, many more billions than just human beings. So too, those beings are few that are reborn among humans, but are more who have been reborn elsewhere than among human beings. And so for those who are actually born on the earth as a human being, those beings are few who are reborn in the middle provinces. This means provinces, uh, you know, a section of the country that has good facilities and is, uh, you know, more sort of uh, developed. Uh, but more numerous are the people that are reborn in the outlying provinces among the uncouth foreigners. Of course, that's what it, it says, uncouth foreigners, but you could take it to, you know, uh, reborn in places where there's a lot more crime or there's not much uh, facilities where you would be able to uh, contact the Dhamma, you know, or uh, even if born in places where the Dhamma was not available, or you didn't have, uh, you know, the books or the internet to, to, to learn and find out about uh, new things, right? So if you're born in outlying regions, remote regions, uh, where you don't have much contact with the, you know, the mainstream world and so on, then, uh, you know, you might not be able to hear the Dhamma, for example. And among those beings are few, few who are wise, intelligent, astute, able to understand the meaning of what has been well stated and what is badly stated. More numerous are those who are unwise, 
uh, you know, foolish, obtuse, unable to understand the meaning of what has been well stated and badly stated. That means you have to have a certain level of, you know, intelligence that when you hear something that's uh, wise, some, you know, uh, statements about, you know, wisdom or the Dhamma that one would be able to understand that rather than say, ah, that's, you know, that's from the devil or that's whatever, you know, they're, they're not able to understand it. They're, they're sunk in their own views and they don't have that uh, intelligence to, to really understand, uh, you know, deeper uh, meanings of things. So are those beings are few who are endowed with the noble eye of wisdom. More numerous are those beings who are confused and immersed in ignorance. So too those beings are few who get to see the Buddha, or let's say in this case, uh, other, you know, uh, well-known or respected uh, you know, Dhamma teachers, to use more contemporary uh, sort of language, but, uh, you, know, to, to, you know, to meet the Buddha or an Arahant or to, to hear the teachings of the Dhamma. So too are those beings are few who get to hear the Dhamma and the discipline expounded by the, the Buddha or their disciples more numerous are those who do not get to hear it. So to those beings are few who having heard the Dhamma, actually r remember it <laughs> or keep it in their mind, retain it in the mind. More numerous are those who having heard the Dhamma, do not retain it in the mind. Just say, oh, you know, that sounds cool, hoo, 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 and just forget about it. Rather than hearing the Dhamma and say, what, what is that? Oh, wow, that's cool. You know, and investigate it. So to those beings are few who examine the meaning of the teachings that have been retained in the mind. More numerous are those who do not examine the meaning of the teachings that have been retained in the mind. So even if you keep the teachings in the mind to really examine uh, the deeper uh, meanings of it. So too, those beings are few who understand the meaning and the Dhamma and then practice in accordance with the Dhamma. So it's not just the fact of hearing the Dhamma, keeping it in your mind, uh, you know, reflecting on the meaning, but actually then uh, practicing the Dhamma. That means practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, practicing, uh, you know, sila, samadhi, and panya, and uh, really, you know, developing one's uh, mind and uh, changing the, the karma, you know, overcoming your negative states of mind and increasing the, the wholesome states of mind. So more numerous are those who do not understand the meaning and the Dhamma and do not practice in accordance with the Dhamma. So too, those beings are few who acquire a sense of urgency about things inspiring urgency. More numerous are those who do not acquire a sense of urgency about things inspiring urgency. So too, those beings are few who, when inspired with the sense of urgency, strive more carefully. <laughs> more numerous are those who, when inspired with the sense of urgency, do not strive carefully. So, you know, that's the whole point, really, of the Dhamma teachings, especially, and that's why, like, the reflection on death. You know, when you, you, you reflect on the possibility that uh, of, on, about impermanence and death, that even though you might be healthy now, look at all these people who have 
who acquired this uh, COVID-19 and they were quite healthy before and within one or two weeks uh, even died. Uh, so, you know, reflecting on the nature of impermanence and the fragility of life, and then the sense of urgency to practice so that you die with the mind uh, having reached some higher degree of, uh, you might say, evolution of consciousness and uh, acquired more wisdom. So too, those beings are few who gain concentration, one-pointedness of mind, based on release. More numerous are those who do not gain concentration or one-pointedness of mind based on release. That means leading to uh, liberation. So even though people might practice the Dhamma uh, and might practice meditation, not all gain uh, deeper states of concentration, isn't it? Uh, because of the so many, you know, the, the hindrances are so deeply ingrained. So too, those beings are few who obtain the exquisite taste of delicious food. More numerous are those who do not gain such food, but subsist on scraps brought in a bowl. So here he's kind of changed the tone a bit. Uh, but then he comes back to, so too, those beings are few who obta obtain the taste of the Dhamma. That means having got a glimpse of the truth, having uh, experienced at least uh, stream entry, uh, had that initial taste of the Dhamma and entered the stream, very few. So even though a lot of people may gain concentration, they don't all gain stream entry uh, because they get too lost in the piti and the sukha or the, the calm and happiness that comes with the deeper concentration and they get distracted by that seeing you know a little light in their mind or whatever other uh you know jhanic factors the, the, they get contented with that and they don't go on to actually uh, develop uh, insight and get that taste of Dhamma, which means that glimpse of the unconditioned, uh, the glimpse of the total transcendence of the ego consciousness. So after having said all that, therefore, monks, you should train yourselves in this way. We will obtain the taste of the meaning, the taste of Dhamma, the taste of liberation. It is in such a way that you should train yourselves. So like that, we went from, uh, the Buddha was pointing out that, you know, it's difficult just to get the human birth. And if you lose the human birth, to get it again is even more difficult. And there's a nice little, uh, in another sutta, he gives a simile of the turtle. So let's say there's a, a, a one-eyed turtle, or even a blind turtle. I think it was a blind turtle. Swimming in the ocean, okay? And this turtle comes up to the surface of the ocean to take a breath of air, only one time in a hundred years. And at the same time, there's a yoke, you know, a wooden ring floating around on the surface of the ocean. And one, once in a hundred years, the turtle comes up to the surface and pokes his head up to take some air. And at that time, the, he gets his head up through that that wooden ring just happens to be there at that spot where the turtle is poking his head up and he, the head goes up uh, through that ring. 
So you mathematically you speaking, that would be a very, very slim chance of that happening in the, in the, in the oceans of the whole earth, right? That once in a hundred years, the turtle is coming up and that one ring happens to be in that place. So you could say, okay, mathematically speaking, it could be possible, just like winning a, you know, a, a billion dollar lottery could be possible. Uh, but so he says, it's more difficult than that to get the human birth after having lost it foolishly and has been reborn in hell or as an animal to get the human birth again. Uh, it's more difficult. So uh, the meaning of that is that, that we should use this uh, precious human birth to create positive karma and to you know, transform our negative karma into positive karma uh, so that we'll have a better chance of uh, getting uh, the human birth uh, again when we die. That's why, uh, because this earth plane is the best place to practice the Dhamma. So if the Dhamma is always in your mind, then that, you see, the moment of death is the most important time of the life, really. Of course, living our life is important, but it's the, the thoughts in your mind at the time of death, whatever is predominantly comes up in your mind at the time of death, then the mind is going to be attracted to that kind of a place. So if you don't have many thoughts about Dhamma, if you're not thinking about the Dhamma in your, ordin in your daily life, and you're thinking about all kinds of other things uh, uh, at the time of death, then probably those thoughts of Dhamma are not going to come up. But if you make a constant frequent habit of you know, meditating and contemplating the Dhamma, uh, so they come up in your mind more and more often, then at the time of death, if that thought or some uh, image about Dhamma arises, then that can be the sign that uh, will draw the mind to uh, like the human birth again in order to uh, take off where you left off on your practice of the Dhamma. So that's just, uh, you know, uh, one example. So, but then, uh, you know, just getting the human birth is, is difficult, but having the other conditions to practice the Dhamma is just as difficult. Uh, and that's what the other conditions were because, you know, so many people are born in the places that don't allow the, you know, freedom to believe what you want to believe or they're born up in other religions, philosophies. And this was a long time ago, of course, before the internet and so on, or people were sort of just trapped within their societies and so on. But even now with the internet, how much, you know, how many people are coming to listen to these Dhamma talks and how many people are going to porn sites? How many people are going to listen to all this other rubbish, all these weird things that are going on in the internet, you know? Probably, you know, thousands of times more people are going to places on the internet that just increase their greed, hatred, and delusion and ignorance rather than uh, taking advantage of all the Dhamma, you know, if you, if you count it up, uh, that. So it's very rare to, for a person to have that interest in the Dhamma. And uh, that's why if you have it, you should protect that. In fact, this kind of teaching was were very important for me when I first heard the Dhamma in Nepal, the first meditation course, and actually this contemplation of the uh, perfect conditions to practice Dhamma, having this human birth and then being able to hear the Dhamma and then get an interest into it and then actually practice it and actually be able to 
to realize it or be, have the condition to become a monastic and carry it through, uh, very few in number have that, uh, you know, that past accumulated common to do that. So we have to protect that, you know, and not to lose it, okay? So anyway, that's what the, that importance is. First, it's difficult to get a human birth, but having a human birth, using it in the best possible way, having the right conditions to be able to actually hear the Dhamma, uh, remember the Dhamma, run it over uh, through your mind, meditate, gain concentration, and then actually enter the stream or the, any other stages of liberation that, that is a very few number of people have this kind of right conditions. So, you know, whatever of those conditions that you have, you should recognize that, you know, that's, a, that's even rare. Just the fact that some of you have been coming to listen to these talks and sutta classes and others, of course, during this pandemic time, maybe you're doing it more, but still, uh, you know, many people have been meditating for a long time. So that, that in itself is uh, rare. You know, even within your own family or circle of old friends, how many are really that much interested in Dhamma practice? You know, not very many. So you have to appreciate that, you know, and to protect it, mainly to protect it and to keep watering those seeds, you know. So that's the important part about, uh, you know, the Buddha, you know, uh, telling these kind of things in these suttas. Okay, so now uh, we want to go on to this uh, uh, this next uh, sutta on the eight accomplishments. So, having got the human birth, having got the interest in the Dhamma, now the Buddha is talking about these, even as a lay person, the eight accomplishments of a lay person, or how a lay person should also uh, uh, practice uh, to accomplish and to make uh, you know uh, good accomplishments using uh, the life. <clears throat> so this is in the book of the eights, actually, Anguttara Nikaya, the book of the eights, and uh, so the. Buddha is talking to the monks and says, monks, there are these eight accomplishments. What eight? Accomplishment in initiative. Accomplishment in protection. Good friendship. Balanced living. Accomplishment in faith. Accomplishment in virtuous behavior. Accomplishment in generosity and the accomplishment in wisdom. These are the eight accomplishments. Now he's going to explain uh, what they are. And what is the accomplishment in initiative? Here, whatever may be the means by which a person a lay person earns their living, whether by farming, by a trade, by raising cattle, by archery, government service, IT, <laughs> to use a modern thing, uh, or some other craft, some other skill. He is skillful and diligent. The person possesses sound judgment about it in order to carry out and arrange it properly. This is called accomplishment in initiative. So basically in whatever you undertake, one should have that skill and diligent and sound judgment in how to uh, carry out that work, that job in a way that's going to prove uh, fruitful for oneself and others. That's called the accomplishment in initiative. When you undertake something, 
to be able to, you know, undertake it in a good way and follow it uh, through. And what is the accomplishment in protection? Here the same person sets up and protects and guards over the wealth they have acquired. The wealth they've acquired in a righteous way, you know, in a, by the sweat of their brow or by the, the means of their intelligence. But gained not by hurting others, gained by still by, you know, following uh, the precepts. And thinking, how can I prevent the uh, government and thieves, although here it says kings, but we'll say government because they're all also trying to take your money, right? Uh, so uh, how to prevent the government and thieves or others from taking it or fire from burning it up, floods from sweeping it off and displeasing heirs from taking it. And that could mean your personal possessions too, whether it's your house or other property or whatever it is. Uh, this is called accomplishment in protection. A lot of people, they have a lot of things, but they don't protect it in a proper way and they wind up losing it uh, well, one way or another because they haven't uh, taken those means of protecting. So the Buddha was very practical, even in these very practical uh, things about, you know, your wealth and uh, livelihood and so on. And what is good friendship? Here in whatever village or town a person lives, they associate with other good people, people of mature virtue, uh, who are people that are accomplished in faith, virtuous behavior, people that are generous and wise. He converses with them and engages in discussions with them. Insofar as they are accomplished in faith, he sort of try, he tries to emulate them with re respect to their accomplishment in faith or in their virtuous behavior. Rather than trying to emulate people without faith and without virtuous behavior, oh, I want to be a tough guy and I want to, you know, be, you know, be the best, uh, you know, thief or whatever. Uh, you know, some people, you know, have these kind of thoughts. So, anyway, having the good friendship like Kalyana Mitta, that will uh, help you to. Uh, you know, attain those accomplishments in, in faith and virtue and, and uh, generosity and wisdom. And what is balanced living? Here, the, the lay person knows his income and expenditures, and they lead a balanced life, neither too extravagant nor too frugal. So here's the, the Buddha saying, you know, you shouldn't be too frugal either. You know, you should, you know, if you have lawfully earned money, you, you use it, you know, to enjoy things, but uh, not to excessive extremes. And to balance, so you don't, uh, in this way, the income will ex exceed my expenditures rather than the reverse. Just as an appraiser or his apprentice holding up a scale knows by so much it has <coughs> uh, dipped down or by so much the weight has gone up or the wealth has gone up or down. So that person knows his income and expenditures and leads a balanced life. In this way, you will live happily. If this lay person has a small income but lives luxuriously, Others would say of him, this person eats his wealth just like an eater of figs. But if he has a large income, but lives sparingly or too frugally, others would say of him, this clansman may even starve himself. So, but it's called balanced living when a lay person knows his income and expenditures 
and leads a balanced life, neither too extravagant nor too frugal. Thus, my, the income will exceed my expenditures rather than the reverse. And what is the accomplishment in faith? Here the lay person is endowed with faith. He places faith in the enlightenment of the Buddha and the, the Dhamma and the Sangha in order to help, uh, you know, help him uh, motivate himself to, to know that it's possible to to reach these progressive levels of, uh, you know, liberation. And, the, you know, faith in the Dhamma that, you know, by practicing these things, it definitely has uh, results. And what is accomplishment in generosity? Here a lay person dwells at home with a heart devoid of miserliness, freely generous, open-handed, delighting in, in charity and giving, delighting in uh, non-attachment and giving things away, sharing. This is called accomplishment in generosity. And what is accomplishment in wisdom? Your lay person is wise. They possess the wisdom and knowledge of arising and passing away, which is the noble and penetrative and leads to, you know, the, the four stages of liberation. These are called the accomplishments in wisdom. So these are called the, the eight accomplishments. So, <clears throat> so we saw that, you know, in these three different uh, the suttas, uh, you know, it illustrates the whole, you know, process of just aimlessly going through sansara and then seeing how hard it is to get the human birth. And once you're getting a human birth, you have the right conditions to actually uh, hear the Dhamma and then remember it and become interested in it, practice it then actually realize it. And then the other m more mundane things that uh, help that, such as the, you know, the balanced living and, uh, and so on. And uh, you know, having a good friendship and so on. So friends, uh, these are just some other things that you can uh, reflect on. Uh, again, they're about motivating the the, the sense of uh, energy to to you know continue your uh, practice or even to uh, intensify one's uh, practice, uh, especially uh, again of studying the Dhamma and the practicing the meditation, especially in these times where you might be having more uh, time. To to do that, to, to use that time uh, wisely. So if anybody has any questions that they want to uh, uh, write down on the chat uh, uh, thing, you can do that. Uh, so there's one so far here. There's an ancient Sri Lankan tradition of a merit book where one notes down one's good deeds over the years. The merit book is read out on the deathbed. So the dying person can reflect on these deeds as they pass away. But I feel, but I feel Bhante seems to be referring to meditation and Dhamma, Vichara, ideally. How should one go about gaining the skill and the art of passing? No, uh, even that way, the, you know, of course, a person doesn't have to write down their good deeds in the book, uh, you know, unless, of course, you know, they might lose their memory and forget about it. But uh, normally you're going to remember what you've done most of your life. You know, most people can remember 
the good things that they've done in their life and, and the bad things that they've done in your life, you know. But of course, if in your older age, if you got something like Alzheimer's or you got, or you got some other kind of dementia where uh, then if you had written those down, somebody could read them to you and then it might jolt your memory, then of course that might, you know, make you happy or, or help you remember that. But normally, you know, one doesn't, may not need to write it down in, a, you know, a merit book because the merits will go with you, you know, the, the mind remembers them. Uh, and it's the same way that people have guilt, worry, remorse, and fear when they do wrong actions, you know, and it follows them around for years and years and years because the, the mind remembers them. But, uh, so actually the Sila Nusati and uh, and so on, these uh, reflections, even the Buddha mentioned those that uh, a lay person can reflect on that, on the, you know, the, the good qualities that one has accumulated and be happy about it, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the, the more good qualities and the good kind of karma that you accumulate, then that will help to outweigh uh, a lot of the other negative things that you might have done you know, in the past. Uh, so this other question. As we see population growth and the lessening of extreme poverty in the world, can this as signs of a net positive and karmic accumulation for the world? Since more people are born as human, and in better circumstances. Thank you. Well, of course, the population of the world has, has been increasing, that's true. Uh, but still, as we read, the number of human beings, even though it is now it's a seven billion, that is very, very few a number compared to the other realms where people can be uh, reborn in. Uh, and yeah, the lessening of extreme poverty uh, in some uh, places, but it, it depends on what one does with the wealth. So most people, when they get out of poverty, they, of course, they want to enjoy the world and so on, and there's no harm in that. But if they have the practice of the Dhamma, they can, uh, you know, at least have less uh, pain and suffering and have hopefully have more uh, leisure time to then uh, practice the Dhamma. If they're not living in such extreme poverty, there's little chance that one can really practice the Dhamma because you spend all of your time just trying to get enough food to eat for yourself or your family. So, so in some sense, there's a net positive in karmic accumulation for the world, but we can see that ignorance is still very, very deeply entrenched. And of course, with the advent of the internet and travel, of course, the Dhamma has spread around the world. So the Dhamma now is, is much more available to people around the world. Uh, uh, who have, you know, maybe gotten out of extreme poverty and at least now living a life where they can at least have some extra time to hear and study the Dhamma and slowly grow. So uh, in that way, yes, there probably is a net uh, uh, positive increase in the, the good karma, but still one has to be very you know, mindful and diligent in not uh, allowing that accumulation of wealth and so on to uh, to get a person more uh, deeply, you know, caught up in bad things, you know, uh, like drugs and other other types of things like that.
would the merit book help a person whose mind is taken over by fear? Uh, well, I suppose it could. I mean, if a person can't remember, if their mind is so consumed with other negative states of mind, yeah, it might temporarily, they lose the track of the, the good things that they might have done earlier because their mind is consumed by something going on in the present moment. So uh, a book like that, if somebody was to read it and remember it, and or a lot of people say, oh, I'm such a terrible person. I've done this and this. And, but remember, oh, remember when back when you were 21, you, 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 you went and helped out at a soup kitchen. Oh, oh yeah, I did that. Yeah, that, I felt good about doing that. You know? So yeah, you, you might remember some good deeds that you did to help somebody in need and so on. So I suppose the merit book may, you know, help like that. Uh, uh, this, humans are planning to colonize Mars <laughs> soon. Are Deva realms actually other planets or are they non-material realms? Yeah, I don't think there's Devas on Mars or other planets. <laughs> uh, they're they're non-material realms, they're, they're mind-created realms. Although, you know, some people say heaven realms, right? They're, even Christians believe in heaven realms and they describe these heaven places. Uh, but they're also mind. I mean, even this earth, even though we're on the earth, our mind is still creating this earth plane consciousness. Because animals are born on earth, but they don't have the same kind of consciousness that you have, that human beings have, right? But they're looking at the same things, but their mind is interpreting it in different ways, right? So therefore, uh, you know, everything is really mind made. And so a deva realm, when you die, there's realms where you know the, the the form like we have this is not not the same you know the different wavelength vibrations like a dream world you know people have a dream that's very real for them you know so when you die you you know, other places are like dreams but permanent dream states as long as that karma lasts even being in a hell or something else, you know, could be a, a mind created realm. Uh, so, but anyway, these things are, you know, if you don't have direct experience in them yourself, it's difficult to, to talk about them. But, uh, you know, this idea to colonize Mars, they should leave it alone, you know. Why ruin that for us? Uh, How do we gauge whether we have done enough in our present life to warrant a rebirth again as a priest? Is there some minimum requirements like practicing dana, meditating regularly, supporting the sangha? <coughs> Does not knowing add to the stress of living? Well, the best way to Try to ensure that you will get another human birth is by attaining stream entry. Because it is said when you attain stream entry, the mind cannot re be reborn in the lower realms. So you'd be reborn only as a human being or a higher in the Deva realms or the Brahma worlds if you had perfected your jhanas and meditation practice. <coughs> So the, I would say that is probably the best guarantee according to the sutta is to uh, attain stream entry because at least you're guaranteed not to be reborn in any lower realms. So you'd be reborn either as a human being or if you've done really good karma, deva realms. But the human realm is what we should strive to be born again in because that's the best place where we can effectively practice and make <coughs> progress uh, on the path of the Dhamma. 
So I'd say the minimum requirements is to attain stream entry is a, is a kind of a, you know, a guarantee. But even if you don't attain stream entry, practicing dana, meditating regularly, having dhamma always in your mind, uh, supporting the sangha, yes, all those definitely uh, will help. Yeah. And actually, you know, like in Sri Lanka, that's why when people die, they actually, you know, have monks come to the, the house before they die to chant sutras, you know, when they're in the hospital. So they'll, they'll remember these things in their mind, hopefully, that when they actually die, the, or they put pictures of the Buddha and other things up in their room so that hopefully their mind will be uh, attracted to those things as they're dying so that it would not be taken down into some darker uh, places. Okay, it uh, looks like that's the end of the questions, friends. Uh, so, anyway, I'm glad you could uh, come and join tonight. So for those who care to uh, stay on for the meditation practice, we will have a short uh, little break to use the rest of the water, <coughs> come back and do a few uh, stretches and have our evening uh, meditation. Okay? <coughs> so we'll see you back here for those who want to join that. We'll see you back here in a So just uh, stand straight, relax the shoulders and arms, just gently close the eyes, feel your feet pressing the floor, and begin some deep, slow breathing, taking a few seconds to slowly breathe in, filling up the lungs, Holding the air in the lungs for a few seconds and slowly breathing out. Just focusing the attention in the body. And coordinating these movements with the breathing. On the next in breath, raise the arms over the head interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch your head back, arch your lower spine, stretch upwards. On the out breath, turn the hands down and touch the top of your head. And again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, head back, arch the spine, feel the sensation. Out breath, touch the top of the head. And the third time, hold that upward stretch longer. And release the fingers on the out breath, arms back to the sides. Relax, just gently close the eyes, just try to feel the increased body sensations, or pulsations, especially in your hands and fingers that got stretched. Just use those increased sensations to help hold the attention and in the body.
Just remember the present moment of standing, standing. Here and now, the body. And then next, on an in-breath, push up on the toes while rising the arms over the head and this way, facing the hands toward each other about six inches apart and stretch up. On the out breath, arms back to the side, heels back to the floor. Use the breathing to help lift and lower the body. With the in breath, just imagine blowing up the helium balloon. The body rises up. Stretch. Out. Once more in. Let's feel the increased sensation. Let's feel where the clothing touches the skin in different places. Just remember standing, standing. And next we'll do the side bending. So in the in breath, raise both arms up. Really keep your fingers and arms straight, close to your head. On the out breath, bend over your right side as far as you comfortably can. Feel that stretch in the side. In breath, lift up. And the next out breath, the other side. In breath. Again to the right out breath. In. Out. In, once more to each side, out breath. And the out breath, lower the arms. Relax, gently close the eyes. Start to feel the subtle life force vibration. If there's any aches or pains, just notice those. It's part of the body. Feel the increased heartbeat.
Okay, one last exercise, the head turning. On the in-breath, turn the head to the right. Try to look over your right shoulder. Turn your eyes to the right also. Look at some spot on the wall behind you. In-breath, turn 180 degrees back to the left. To look over the left shoulder. In breath back to the right. Out breath left. In breath to the right. Out breath left. On the next in breath, let the head stop in the center. Let's try to feel the outline of the whole body. Sense the feet pressing the floor, the arms at the sides, the head on top. Feel that increased aliveness in the whole body. Okay, friends, go ahead and sit back down for the sitting meditation. And one of the, uh, my favorite uh, sort of you know, translations or meaning of the you know, word meditation is you know, keeping the mind in the middle, really. It's, it comes from that same word, M-E-D-I, to keep the mind in the middle. You know, and I like to interpret that as that is, you know, keeping it in the middle of the body because that means centered and grounded, centered, uh, you know, in the breathing body. That's the, the middle path. Uh, not going too far out and not getting too lost in, uh, into the, inner uh, quietness. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn off my video again so you can focus your own body and mind. So just try to sit straight. First of all, just feel the weight of your body pressing the seat or your buttocks or feet press the floor just feel those contacts pressure or hardness of the earth vibration You feel your hands touching together with it, or where they're touching together or where they touch your legs. So again, just the earth vibration. And gently kind of 
stretch the spinal column, the back and the spine upwards to imagine some space between the spinal vertebrae. And feel the head balanced on top. To feel the center of gravity of the head and spine over the hip. Just having the eyes gently closed, just sort of mentally feel the outline of the sitting body. Especially just feel the head there on top of the body. Feel some sensations on your face. You feel where your lips touch together. You feel the tongue inside the mouth. Your gums or teeth. You notice several different types of sensations. And take a few deep, slow breaths to try to feel the air moving through the nostrils. If you take a deep enough breath, you might even hear the sound of the breathing. Hold the air in the lungs a few seconds and slowly breathe out. And even while taking a couple more deep, slow breaths, you can feel your eyes in the socket. The eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. From that point behind the eyes, you just try to feel the, the outline of the sitting body. It's that sense of the feet touching the floor, the buttocks, the hand touching. The head on top. Feel the whole breathing body. Again, can try to take a few more deep, slow breaths, it's cultivating this mindfulness. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Deliberately cultivating long breaths. Breathing in long, know that you're breathing in long. When you're breathing out long, know that you're breathing out long. After breathing in, to hold the air in the lungs a few seconds to feel the pause. And feel the long, contracting, relaxing out breath. And the pause. 
So we're going to try counting the breaths from one to ten, try to continue the deep, slow breathing with the pauses. It's really an effective way to concentrate. It's good for the body and mind also. So with the next expanding in breath, mentally count one. We're holding in the air. On the long contracting out breath, also count one. The next in breath, expanding in breath, count two. Holding in the breath a couple seconds, just feel the outline of the sitting body. And then on the out breath, contracting out breath, count two. Let's ride the contracting out breath down to the end. Feel the last bit of air go out. And the next expanding in breath, count three. Contracting out breath, count three. In breath, four. Out breath, four. In breath, five. Out breath, five. In breath, six. Out breath, six. In breath, seven. Out breath, seven. In breath, eight. Out breath, eight. In breath, nine. Out breath, nine. In breath, ten. Out breath, ten. Now just continue the counting. Just continue controlling the breath. Just let the breathing return to its own uncontrolled rhythm. And continue to feel it, to feel the lesser, the shorter breaths. Just keep the attention focused there in the middle of the body. Feel the 
subtler movements of the abdomen, rib cage, your chest. Breathing in a shorter breath, one knows. One's breathing in a shorter breath. Breathing out a shorter breath, one knows. One's breathing out a shorter breath. Start to see how each breath is different. Sometimes longer or shorter. Try to notice the brief pause between the breaths. The pause might just be a fraction of a second. Try to notice that. Just noticing the whole breath body. Expanding in breath, the brief pause, the contracting out breath, the brief pause. During those brief pauses, you feel the outline of the sitting body. Remember one is sitting. This breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. It's a present moment connection. The breathing body, this breathing body is the connection to the present moment awareness. It's continually remembering this in, in sitting, out, out, sit. Mm -hmm. It's the applied and sustained thought to the breathing. Mindfulness is not forgetting, not forgetting the present moment. Breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, moment by moment, breath by breath. At the same time, being alert for any other sensations that attract your attention, any aches or pains, or any thoughts trying to sneak in, any of the hindrances. In, in, sitting. Out, 
out, sitting. The pauses between the breaths, check the posture. The head is drooping down, the spine is slouching, gently straighten back up. Try to keep the chin level parallel with the floor. An alert body equals an alert awareness. Try to feel settler and settler sensations connected with the breathing process. Noticing how each breath is different. If you get lost in thoughts, recognize it as lost, lost, thinking, thinking. Gently let go of the thoughts, take a deep, slow breath, bring the mind back into the body. Get re-centered, grounded in the breathing body. Take a couple of deep, slow breaths.
Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Just gradually opening up the, the flow of impermanence. To notice other sensations coming and going in between the breath. Even at the same time as feeling the breathing, you can feel some other sensations on the body. And hear some sound coming and going in your room. And each out breath, just allow the body and mind to relax more and more to the present moment. When you relax, you naturally will notice and feel so many other sensations. You can notice subtler thoughts or urges moving through the mind. Relaxing doesn't mean drifting off or going to sleep. It means relaxed alertness. Relaxed but very alert. If you've been practicing vipassana, try to notice, identify the five aggregates. This is material form, some sensation. This is the feeling, pleasant, painful quality of the sensation. This is the perception, any mental image or name or label of the object. This is the volitional formations, any thoughts about it or bodily movement. This is consciousness, the ego consciousness. Thought of I, me, or mine.
from time to time, take some deep, slow breaths to help stay grounded, connected in the body, the present moment. If you're able to, just let the awareness kind of expand. Kind of notice and feel more and more sensations all throughout the body. Noticing how quickly various sense stimulations are rising and vanishing and changing. the six senses. Breathing in, beholding impermanence. Breathing out, beholding impermanence. One trains oneself.
breathing in, mentally letting go of all the sensations and thoughts. Try to sense that subtle awareness. The mental space through which all sensations, thoughts. Just coming and going, arising and vanishing. Feel the fading away of any reaction. Just let the little remaining sense of I or me there also fade away. Let it fade out into the background.
kind of thoughts or perceptions arise in the mind by hearing that sound. Sambhi Sankara Anichati Sambhi Sankara Dukati Sambhi Dhamma Anatati Yana Panyaya Pasati Atani Bindati Dukhi Esa Mago Visu All conditioned things of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. All impermanent things have clung to with ignorance bring suffering. And all dhammas as well as conditioned dhammas and also the unconditioned dhamma, the deathless element, without any owner or controller. They're not self. When one sees these three characteristics with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. And thus spoke the Buddha. Now let's spend the last few minutes of the meditation sending out thought feelings of metta to ourself and all other beings. Do this combined with the deep slow breathing. So Begin taking in a few deep, slow breaths again. After breathing in, hold the air in the lungs as long as you comfortably can to imagine and feel it. That oxygen going into the bloodstream being carried out to all the cells of the body. Just imagine that as being the metta going out to your cells of the body. And feel the relaxing contraction of the, the out breath. Just take several more deep, slow breaths, trying to feel that, thinking like this to yourself. May I be well, peaceful, and wise. May I be free from the pain, sorrows, and sufferings of body and mind brought about by such unskillful thought, speech, and action. May I have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. And be able to create, cultivate the right conditions to help ensure a better rebirth, if there is rebirth, or better conditions in the next life to continue practicing the Dhamma. Again, again, sending these metta vibrations out to others, your family members, friends. If you know anybody that's suffering from any illness or sickness, send some extra metta sensations, especially after breathing in, holding in the breath, imagine those powerful body sensations like metta radiating outwards like a healing energy going out to enter the bodies and minds of people you're thinking about, people in general, and send some extra metta thoughts to Prashant and his mother, who has 
have been diagnosed with a terminal illness, sending out thoughts to soothe their worries, anxieties, or fears. And with each out breath, just imagine these metta vibrations going further and further outward through the towns and cities, across the oceans, back to your home countries if you have one, you came from a different country. Eventually just imagine these metta vibrations surrounding the whole earth and beyond. It's with the idea that may all living beings be well, peaceful and wise. May all beings be free from greed, hatred, fear and ignorance. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings have the opportunity to hear the Dhamma, to learn and practice meditation to free their minds from suffering. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. It's like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful, and wise. And invite you to join in chanting the word sadhu three times slowly on a long out breath. Take a deep in breath, hold a breath a few seconds. So putting a smile on your face to know that whatever difficulties you might be going through it's it's just created by the mind okay friends so this ends our Wednesday evening Sutta study and meditation. So, hope you can continue your meditation practice at home. Again, the more you practice, meditate, contemplate the Dhamma, read suttas, all these stay in your mind. 
uh, longer, longer, go deeper, conscious, so if anything happens, that should happen sooner than later. Hopefully the mind will be attracted toward the Dhamma. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. So on Sunday, we'll have again uh, have a questions and answers sessions. So if you're not going to, you know, be attending the session live on the Zoom, uh, if you want to write a Dhamma question down, and if I have time, I will. Uh, if you listen to the recordings at a later time.